Hello, and welcome to Scurf Interviews. This is the fifth of the seven episode mini series exploring block science, crypto economics, and computer aided governance. In this episode, we feature Kelsey Nabin, lead social scientist at Block Science, and Eric Christopher Alston, who is a scholar in residence at CU Boulder and a contributor to Block Science. Together, we discuss challenges and opportunities pertaining to governance, uh, which entails exploring some governance vulnerabilities what it takes to actually create resilient governance systems, some of the emerging methodology and practice around this, as well as some social, technical, and economic components that pertain to these challenges. Without further ado, here's the interview. Eric and Kelsey, thank you for joining us today. And let's just start off by having the two of you tell us a little bit about yourselves. And uh, yeah, we'll kick off with intros. My name is Eric Alston, and I'm a scholar in residence in the finance division at the University of Colorado Boulder. And so among other topics, I study digital governance in particular. A lot of this episode is going to be about governance, so I won't belabor the definition here, but a lot, several of my publications deal with governance of distributed blockchain networks in particular. And that research stream has led to a number of interesting sort of applied opportunities advising DAOs and other distributed networks in terms of their governance, primarily through block science, which I understand this podcast is part of a series introducing and demystifying. And I'm Kelsey Nabin. I am uh, the lead of the governance research team at Block Science, as well as a PhD researcher at RMIT University in Australia, and that's on resilience in decentralized technologies. And I can explain more about what that means if you're interested. Uh, and so really, uh, the Block Science research team is about conducting primary research and then about testing those kind of theoretical ideas and assumptions in industry applications. And so I kind of, yeah, I don't believe there's such thing as a governance expert, but I believe that um, interdisciplinary research in this area is incredibly important because we're talking about socio-technical infrastructures. Absolutely. And I think it might be then a helpful point to start with sort of a, a definitional a beginning to this journey and clearly outlining what is it we mean when we say the word governance. I think trying to encapsulate everything governance means into a single phrase is hard, but I do teach in these areas, so I've got to try. So I'll lead off with my fairly parsimonious definition, although there is more to governance in, than what I described. But to me, the overarching goal of governance is rule-based ordering of people and natural resources. That's necessarily dynamic. Real world governance problems are not static and are not resolvable for all time in a moment. And so that means governance necessarily entails the successful dynamic rule-based ordering of people and natural resources, especially surrounding the problems that social groups tend to create when resources are scarce within a particular group and there is uncertainty about how to proceed. But I also want to hear from Kelsey. Oh, that was a good definition. I would like to talk about a few different definitions because I think a healthy starting point is to acknowledge that we don't necessarily need to in invent it <laughs> um, just because we're working in uh, new sort of technologies. And so uh, there's a few different aspects of governance that I guess I've drawn on uh, myself and with colleagues when sort of thinking about it and, and writing about it and so on. Uh, one is governmentality, which is uh, structuring the field of action. And that comes out of Foucault. So we're talking about kind of deep, deep philosophy here. And so that's a very, very broad definition. That field is literally wherever and however governance is operationalized. Another uh, definition that I've found helpful is to think about institutional infrastructure. So that's getting more specific in terms of the people, processes, norms and institutions that kind of run in parallel or um, interplay with the operation of technology itself. Um, another definition I actually found when, when thinking about this um, 
this question uh, was one that Ellie Rennie uh, uses in a paper that uh, was co-written with uh, Michael Zaga, myself and a few others from the Medigov research community. And that talks specifically about governance interactions within such systems as solving societal problems or creating societal opportunities and attending to the institutions as contexts for these governance interactions. But I wanted to make sure that I emphasize uh, one thing that we've kind of developed at Block Science, and this was really led by uh, Michael Zagam, was the idea of a governance surface. And so that takes uh, the kind of Foucault idea around governmentality and um, combines it with control theory. So thinking about the control surface, which is, you know, defining the uh, parameters of a, you know, cybernetic system, but applying that to governance because, as I mentioned, we're in this interdisciplinary field. So now we have a governance surface, which is the set of parameters through which an organization's code can be modified or, or really defining where governance occurs within, you know, a, a decentralized kind of code-based system. And so uh, that's something that we've drawn on a lot in some of our research and practice and thinking about uh, the separation, I guess, between the governance surface and uh, what methodologies can we develop to analyse that, to actually, you know, look at it and, and define exactly what it is for specific contexts and then governance operation, like, sorry, where governance is operationalized. So then what are the actions that happen within that governance surface, which has been predefined? And I think that's really helpful in code-based systems because it makes it clear that someone is making decisions about defining governance. It's not just happening. It's not um, objective. It's completely subjective. And we're uh, making choices in how to shape that field. To just add briefly to that, one of the really cool areas where my work intersects with that of uh, Kelsey and Zargums in particular is when they say governance surface, I'm often describing a constitution. It's not a one for one overlap, but there's a set of things that are set apart from the ordinary operations of a system an organization of humans, a public government, if we're talking about a traditional constitutional system of ordering. But there are flags that would be raised in many people's minds if a constitutional amendment process was triggered as compared to the ordinary activities of government. And so there's a shell which to me definitely evokes the surface notion that Kelsey has described, which is relatively more rigid in the vast majority of human organizational systems. In public governance, that's called a constitution. More generally, it's called secondary rules. Or as Kelsey has labeled it, it's a governance surface that defines the operations, the ordinary operations of a particular productive unit or group of individuals. Eric, how does that differ in kind of nation states or maybe traditional ideas that people would have of a constitution or even corporate organizations and sort of blockchain settings? Part of the furor over blockchains surrounds the fact that they're relatively decentralized compared to the governance of traditional intermediaries, especially financial intermediaries, if we're talking about cryptocurrencies, such that distributed networks like those supporting Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc., actually display characteristics more traditionally associated with public constitutional ordering. And so the private firm is more like a dictatorship. And blockchain networks are a whole lot more like democratic constitutional ordering as we have come to associate it with public governance contexts. Yeah, I was thinking too about some of the methodology stuff that we're developing around, you know, that constitution is not written on tablets of stone or on, you know, documents that Constitution DAO can buy, but it's, you know, it's being encoded in software as well. So some of the really interesting work by um, by the phenomenal um, data scientists at Block Science and the research team is is 
you know, looking at the rules or those constitutional rules in smart contracts, uh, which I've just found fascinating as a social scientist to see how they kind of, you know, create fields and go in and kind of scrape smart contracts for that information and, and kind of present like, you know, here are the rules of the actions that you can take in this particular, you know, blockchain system, uh, which kind of formulates or, or presents what their constitution is from the code. I see analogies between the exciting work you just referenced, Kelsey, and the ultimate development of uniform contractual terms in many common law uh, jurisdictions governing business practices, which is to say that we've had a protean version of smart contracts for a long time. Those were the default commercial rules applied to voluntary economic interactions among individuals. Everyone, or at least everyone informed enough to be a repeat player in high stakes commercial context, contexts, everyone informed enough to be a repeat player in high stakes commercial contexts knows that that set of default rules is applying. And so what I see is, is that's like the human drive towards standardizing institutional terms to where they become more and more off the shelf. And so part of what excites me about innovation in the smart contract space is precisely because we're defining viable institutional terms that ideally can be replicated in other contexts. To me, that's really cool, but it's also directly analogous to the more, you know, analog process of that in normalizing the way we treat commercial players in common law jurisdictions around the world. Yeah, I guess something else that's come up in a couple of conversations recently and, and credit where credit's due, I heard it uh, in discussion with the blockchain gov research team and then also in some optimism um, governance workshops is this delineation between what is normative governance and what is legislative governance. And I think that I mean, that's really important and obviously as um, using ethnographic methods, so kind of observational uh, social science and interviews and the study of kind of people and, and community and culture, it's looking at those on-chain dynamics and saying, hey, we can find the governance surface here in what the smart contract says. But then also that's not the only place that governance occurs and we need to look at the conversations, the discord channels, the discourse forums, the the back channeling, the politics uh, and all these other ways in which uh, governance is represented in, um, in these systems. Absolutely. And in constitutional parlance, one way of separating between different layers of that governance surface each of which matter. So the design of smart contracts integrally matters, but the broader blockchain network within which that smart contract is executing is greatly defining the viable terms of that smart contract itself. But what are easier to change? The terms of the smart contract compared to updating the blockchain protocol. That's an analogy to ordinary legislation versus constitutional ordering, which necessarily is harder to amend than it is to pass a law in the national legislature. And so apologies for returning to the horse that I do ride on, which is constitutional governance, but it is a lens for understanding the processes of these networks in a way that I, I find illuminating, as do some of my readers. Yeah, and I would be interested in hearing from both of you on especially recognizing some of the differences between, say, corporate governance and, you know, traditional governance and governments and uh, looking for, at least from an ideological perspective, how uh, there is this intention to have openness and bottom up and all these wonderful, you know, communal ideals, at least in theory, that doesn't always 
frequently doesn't translate to practice, if we're being honest. Uh, and so I was wondering, as you're both researching it from various perspectives, how much is there more and more of a codification of culture in the equivalent of these smart, you know, smart contracts, digital constitutions, however you want to frame it, or should those be fundamentally kept as separate elements, just need to be understood as their own kind of independent entities uh, versus kind of having this in uh, regard, um, no matter how you can't fully separate them, even if you try to explore them in isolation. There's a lot there. I'll, I'll dive in unless Kelsey wants to. I'm currently writing a piece with uh, Primavera de Filippi, Morshid Manon, Vessel Ryers, and Nicholas Saul, all sort of, I call them the European blockchain contingent. But uh, it, it about the relationship between the norms and values and, dare I say, culture of a particular community, the Little C Constitution, as it's called, and enshrining those values into the protocol itself. And so ultimately, individual network users, when they execute a smart contract, absent fraud or coercion, we can assume that those terms reflect their interests sufficiently for them to voluntarily be entering that contract. And so in a sense, there's a revealed preference nature in terms of the values of the community at the smart contract level. But as relevantly is this question of the extent to which a network's protocol reflects the values of those governed by it. That is the tension between a little C constitution versus that which is enacted in the formal document in the case of public ordering, or the formal protocol in the case of distributed network order. And a stylized example I use that's actually germane to distributed network contexts surrounds financial privacy. A friend of mine's a partner at a financial regulation law firm in Washington, D.C. He interfaces with regulators constantly, and he always loves to have his gotcha moment of Show me in the Constitution where the founders guaranteed you a right to financial privacy. To which my common response is, so if the Constitution did not guarantee others a right to life, it would be okay for me to murder someone? Obviously not. It's the case that the Constitution reflects deeply held values for social ordering that are more than what it can articulate at any particular moment. And so for me, there's this constant sort of interesting tension between the values of the community that a constitution or distributed set of rules governing a particular network and that it, the, the effective values of the community that is being governed by that set of rules. When I heard about that research, I kind of realized the difference there between explicit and implicit constitutions. And that was sort of enlightening for me, I guess, around you know how communities can have implicit constitutions. And I think that's really important to point out, especially, you know, in the context of quote unquote, you know, code is law or in that sort of um, zeitgeist, I guess. Eugene, your question was around comparing blockchain governance to kind of corporate and, and cooperative and other spheres, if I understand correctly. Well, it, it was thinking in the sense, uh, as we were kind of, uh, as uh, Eric was bringing up this idea of kind of constitutions and, you know, to the earlier point of uh, thinking of it as structures, and I, I really appreciate the way you're breaking out a surface, right, as we're kind of mapping these different concepts to contextualize what governance means in these decentralized environments, how much can we explore governance without looking at culture versus how much are they inherently intertwined as a collective exploration with just different subcomponents? Um, Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I guess now that I've thought about it, I'll answer the question that I asked myself then, and then I'll answer your question. Um, I just want to point out that there's really interesting um, thinking and research across different disciplines that is worth people looking at. Um, the RMIT University team and the Blockchain Innovation Hub, which I'm obviously a researcher in, you know, they're institutional economists. So they're looking at uh, corporate systems and, and economic governance and comparing that to blockchain. But that's just one specific framing. 
Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge the others. So I've done a bit of research on looking at cooperatives and um, a shout out to the kind of platform cooperative consortium community that have really leaned in to the emergence of things like DAOs and said like, we don't necessarily endorse it, but we do want to understand it and we do want to build bridges of understanding between cooperatives and these new or maybe old kind of ideas that are coming out in, you know, DAOs as, as kind of, you know, democratic participatory organisations and, and see what can be learned uh, between the two fields. Uh, and that's led to some stuff, uh, you mentioned bottom up, but specifically around kind of data trusts and that was fascinating to me because uh, the blockchain community more broadly, I'm referring to the Twitter sphere, obviously, when I talk about the blockchain community, um, you know, they just ate that up. They were like, this is fantastic. Yes, this is exactly what we're trying to do. Like DAOs are the kind of fiduciary stewards of people's data. And, you know, some of the original world's best thinkers around kind of, you know, literally the paper titled um, Bottom Up. Uh, data trust by uh, Sylvie uh, Delarue, um, you know, they were like, no, I don't think, a, you know, an encoded institution or this kind of thing that you call a, a DAO that I'm unfamiliar with could be a, a fiduciary steward. You know, we're talking about people's data. This is often in relation to vulnerable, vulnerable populations. And so, again, there's so much scope to build uh greater kind of uh, literacy and understanding across fields and, and really kind of more deeply explore those ideas. Part of what Kelsey just emphasized is displays the potentially transformative nature of distributed network governance in practice, which is you have institutional economists, and I would place myself in that field, sorry, Kelsey, and, and effectively they're saying, hey, this is potentially a massively important organizational innovation. Then you have scholars of cooperatives, both ethnographers as well as approaching it from dis different disciplinary lenses altogether saying, hey, this is potentially really transformative. To me, that's a testament that both displays the promise as well as the challenge, which is to say Traditional mechanisms of corporate governance, bringing it back to Eugene, part of Eugene's animating question, emerged to ameliorate different incentive problems. One of those incentive problems surrounded, you know, aligning the interests of investors and the managers of their funds who undertake costly and risky bets with other people's money. That creates a classic set of incentive problems. Another set of problems, though, surround information costs, which is I enjoy the fact that I can't govern all of my investment funds precisely because that means I'm diversified to a level I could never be otherwise. But that means that this technology is transformative for certain applications and not for others, potentially. To put it differently, I see us in sort of a discovery phase, exploring the boundary of which forms of highly centralized, dare I say dictatorial forms of corporate governance still exist for deep underlying efficiencies. And which forms exist due to old technology that we now have an innovation that enables us to get around. And that's what I see a lot of this DAO discovery process is engaged in, is which forms of organizational activity, which purposes for collective action now are tractable to a more transparent and more decentralized form of governance. That's helpful to Eugene's actual question, because, you know, how do you study these systems? I mentioned in my kind of opening response around the sort of interdisciplinary nature of, you know, blockchain-based systems. And so I think having these multiple lenses and allowing them to rub up against each other and, and overlap and, and challenge each other's sort of uh, worldviews is, is really important. And so I guess as part of this, you know, research series, we've covered off on you know, a number of those lenses on kind of, you know, engineering methods and measurement and, and data science and all these things. 
you know, wearing my ethnographer's hat, I I want to know, you know, what are the the social dynamics and the social outcomes of of these systems, and so. I'm actually writing a piece at the moment which is called The Ethnography of a Dow and that's been accepted into Epic, which is like a big conference for ethnographers. Um, and Zahagam's actually my co-author for that, which I find hilarious because he's quite a good ethnographer despite being, you know, a expert in control theory and doing his PhD in like robotics or, or something, robotics and optimization. Um, but that's really, you know, it's looking at, as I mentioned before, you know, what what can't be seen in the metadata or, or on chain of, of kind of, you know, formal transactions, quote unquote, in these systems that still compose, uh, you know, governance and, and essential parts in, in many senses. Um, so that's been really fun, you know, to kind of find these anecdotes and vignettes about, you know, the, the janky ways that we're composing, you know, Discord chats with Discord forums and then snapshot votes and then three people co-sign a multi-sig and that moves the funding. Um, you know, Satoshi would roll over in his, who knows if it's a grave or not because we don't know who it is, but, um, you know, it's it's so evolutionary from some of the kind of initial ideas of peer-to-peer distributed networks but I really appreciate it too because it's beyond, uh, you know, economic infrastructure per se to kind of, you know, social systems and, you know, spaces for artists and musicians to, you know, find expression and collective belonging and, and all of these things. So they're much more than, um, you know, governance systems. They're, you know, communities and it's important to, you know, draw out some of those things. And so I guess that's a a long response, but, you know, in that piece we also try and frame tools. And so there's a number of them, a a really, uh, I guess, a feature or something that's become really important in our methodologies to understand decentralised systems when we kind of start a project or want to research and, and find a case study or whatever is just this thing we've called mapping and Zagam and I released a like self-published um, zine, which was like, you could like buy the NFT of it. It was pretty cool. Cause like no one had really done that at the time. Um, it didn't really take off, but that's okay. Um, so we had this zine, which talked about, um, you know, navigating information infrastructure and all about like mapping and, and, um, you know, decentralized systems as like the ship of Theseus, which is like this um, Greek mythology of like this big ship that keeps on sailing, but each part, you know, breaks down and is replaced while it's in motion pretty much. And and that's exactly, you know, the systems we're talking about. They're being built and composed and recomposed like as we're, you know, riding the ship. Uh, And so there's a number of of tools around, um, mapping an ecosystem and obviously the the scientists or the data scientists bring like such great rigor to just diagramming things which I really appreciate um there's resilience mapping and vulnerabilities has become uh, really kind of uh, foregrounded in in a lot of our methodologies around if you want to create more resilient systems meaning aligning that you know constitution or that um what Eric calls the animating purpose of a a system or a community, and I love that verbiage. If you want to align that purpose uh, to the kind of practices, uh, then you need to um, you need to a kind of be aware of of what it is. Um, but that's you know to to make that resilient, you want to identify the vulnerabilities or the things that are potentially going to undermine whether they're, um, you know, internal or external to the system. And interestingly, they're very often, you know, internal and arising from those, you know, personal and political dynamics rather than, you know, some existential, you know, censorship threat or something. Uh, 
that's another tool. And then the team has um, some other amazing things that they've uh, they've worked on. So one of those is what we call the CAG map and CAG stands for Computer Aided Governance and that was largely developed by Barada. And that's, it looks really simple because it's a picture, uh, but it's just like very deeply thought through framework for participatory decision making. And it kind of goes through these cycles of, you know, definition and evaluation and, you know, conversation and all these things. Um, but that's on our um, blog and definitely a research, resource worth checking out. There was something uh, Kelsey just mentioned that I think bears repeating which is, and it's related to the animating purpose that she also mentioned, which is any of these organized, or to put it in my parlance, constituted communities. So they formally organized and they've defined their governance surface, whether or not they're calling that a constitution, it's a set of secondary rules defining the processes of governance for that community. They organize for a common shared purpose a lot of the cool is there it's in we agree and we're here because we value this thing we want to do this thing together this leads back to the old fuddy-duddy the constitutional scholar making a very unpopular point which is the stuff that's fun the stuff that's cool in a community You usually don't need governance for that, even though governance is the glue that makes stuff work in the background, because there's several paradoxical paradoxical issues that emerge when it comes to constituting an organization surrounding a shared purpose that can be easily forgotten because when you come together to say, we're creating a new organization, we're creating a DAO, it's of necessity this kind of you know unifying moment of we all agree we want to do this awesome thing together. That's what I call the animating purpose, as Kelsey referenced. The problem is, is once you constitute an organization, everyone's relative interests are fixed. That has a really vexing challenge for any rule changes in the future. It means they'll benefit some members and they'll harm other members' interests. In public choice, this is called a constitutional political economy. It exists in every organization. And so if you talk to scholars of organizational change, organizational change is costly precisely because it creates these winners and losers. But it gets worse because it's even more structural than that. And I wrote a piece for Metagov in particular, the Metagov DAO, exploring this idea entitled Governance as Conflict. Sounds really pessimistic. To me, it's like embrace the pessimism because that's what governance is all about. Because this other structural problem is unavoidable. The more every member of an organization, animated by its really cool shared purpose, agrees about how the organization should proceed, the less you need a governance decision. And if it's at 100%, that will spontaneously emerge every time because every member of the organization agrees that's what the organization should do next. But the more there's disagreement about how to proceed given an uncertain event, given given a sudden influx of users to a particular network whose interests and understanding is different from that of the original class of users, the more there's disagreement among members of that organization that still has the same shared purpose. The more that there is disagreement, the more you need governance resolution of that question. And so it always comes across as really pessimistic but I'm trying to get down to the brass tacks of what is governance. And it often involves conflict in unfortunate ways. If it resolves it in a way that's certainly not destructive, that might be the best thing your governance system can achieve at a particular moment. 
It's interesting that you mentioned that example. I know, uh, I don't want to quote them publicly as I don't know if they would appreciate me doing so, but uh, someone in the space told me, you know when I think a DAO would work best? If five people who love a concrete goal but hate each other's guts are working on a problem together because then we're going to work through interesting governance. So <laughs> I was like, that, that's a fascinating concept. I don't know how you initially build and seed that community. But yeah, that it, we shouldn't avoid the importance of that tension to actually progress through hard problems and do the most interesting work and get down to, to brass tacks, so to say, of what are the, the open challenges. But yeah, Kelsey, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to say that Jessica Zartler from the, um, the team at Block Science just says like, Governance is a trash fire and like has a little meme of a smiling bin with a fire coming out of it. Um, So that also works. Um, Eric, off the back of what you said, I I also just wanted to mention some terms and I kind of reference a bunch of things as I speak because if it's interesting, I want people to be able to go and kind of investigate it themselves. But uh, Zagam and I in this paper called Aligning uh, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations to Precedence in Cybernetics talk about this principle of requisite variety. And so it it comes from um, uh, Ashby, a cybernetician in kind of like the uh, mid-20th century when these people were also thinking about, you know, information systems and, you know, control or kind of steering them uh, in productive ways. Um, Requisite variety is around aligning system dynamics, meaning the allocation of function and resources to that system purpose that we've been talking about. And so I think that's a really healthy way to think about, you know, how uh, adaptive you want the system. And I talked about, you know, mentioned the word resilience a couple of times, but, you know, I take that to mean Uh, you know, adaptability and transformability in response to kind of perturbation, so sort of threats or crises or or changes in environment in a system. And so governance is there to, or the governance surface and what you define that surface as, is there to steer the system and knowing that, you know, changes are going to need to occur. There's, uh, There's this thing about like how, how adaptive should the system be versus how kind of set and concrete as Eric was saying, you know, once you set it, like how do you, it's really, really hard to change it. And so we did some thinking um, drawing on sort of that field of uh, literature and and thought. uh, And that was just one potentially useful concept for people to investigate further. And I, I welcome people to kind of read that paper and engage. It's got some, some really interesting ideas around, um, especially another theoretical model called the uh, viable system model, uh, which, again, we don't need to reinvent governance. We can look at what has come from these other fields and, you know, test these tools in our kind of methodologies and analysis and, and see what is useful in various contexts. And I really like uh, Kelsey's emphasis on rigidity versus flexibility as it's called in in constitutional scholarship. But more generally, the viability of a system depends on its ability to adapt. In institutional economics, this is called the non-ergodicity of the world or the inevitable incompleteness of all of our institutional remedies, which is the one certainty for governance is that it will need to adapt. Thomas Jefferson was familiar with this, and he speculated that maybe it would be good if we had a new constitution every generation. We developed the empirical methods necessary to test the lifespans of constitutions around the world, and on average, they endure a generation. That's not me arguing that change at the constitutional level is good at all times. It's also not me saying, hey, I don't like constitutional change. I think it's very context specific. But at the end of the day, our institutions need to adapt because they cannot contemplate all unforeseen circumstances. Think of the Dow hack. Think of the debates over forking to Bitcoin cash to take a few of the storied examples in this particular sector. Those were change needs of a particular community. 
In the case of the Dow hack, rather suddenly, we have a very bad actor. Should we punish them, given that we have the technical power to do so, even though that might violate constitutional norms of the community? In the case of Bitcoin Cash, simple disagreements over the number of transactions that the network should be able to facilitate at the block level. But in either case, it required ultimately massive change to the underlying rule set to accommodate the divergent preferences. And so for me, the one certainty for governance is unfortunately uncertainty. This is called incompleteness in institutional scholarship, but in constitutional scholarship, it gives rise to the need for amendment rules directly. How do you change your fundamental rule set or in, in, in the language of blockchain communities, how do you update your protocol? Yeah, the whole idea of uh, the importance of embracing change and the inevitability of it feels uh, apt to apply well beyond just governance and blockchains. Um, and I, I kind of want to steer us in a uh, as we're uh, as we're continuing through the conversation, maybe towards the direction of some more concrete examples of what actually studying these topics looks like. Because I think for a lot of folks who are not as close to it as yourselves, uh, all these concepts can sound great, but they can sound very armchair philosophical. Let's have a drink at the end of the evening and talk about some philosophy of a better world. And it doesn't actually translate to, well, how can I explore community X and understand what's going on there from a governance perspective? So I'd be interested in hearing uh, whether whether you want to take it specifically and say more of a direct DAO analysis or just uh, studying governance in concrete communities, I, I would love to hear kind of how you both think about uh, going about that. I can talk about some of the projects we've done with various um, teams or protocols or communities or, or DAOs, depending on what they are. Uh, so one of those is a vulnerability assessment, which we did of Lido DAO. So that was super interesting. It was um, a blog piece that came out of my kind of PhD research on this idea of vulnerability assessments. And then uh, the CTO reached out on Twitter and was like, oh, this is amazing. Can you do this for our DAO? Like we want to know like what what do we not see? Or, or maybe we're aware of some of these areas, but how as a community can we have this conversation um, and actually kind of enact uh some some ways to potentially address these as well because the whole you know the literature that this comes out of in science and technology studies talks about that once vulnerabilities are identified they can be addressed and so we looked across uh, a number of, of viewpoints and that ended up becoming kind of the social technical uh, legal and economic dynamics of these systems and it was very uh, mixed methods so we employed um, ethnography we looked at you know their forums we looked at how many views or what kind of reaction certain topics had in their community um, you know twitter telegram these kinds of things we conducted a number of interviews with uh, some of the lido team as well as uh, validators that uh, participate in the dao uh, as well as kind of you know, adjacent people from uh, kind of comms to analytics to um, insurance uh, that were related uh, to the to the network, and then uh, on the technical side, we looked at um, a couple of really interesting things came up actually, and it was Barada that uh, kind of championed this, and I caveat which is what the blog says as well around that, you know, we didn't do like sort of formal contract audits. This was about kind of this like, you know, assessment of like what can we find within like a limited sort of time frame. And um, some of the, the areas that he looked were really unique to me and I actually hadn't seen anyone else sort of have conversations about them. But that was at, um, you know, technical interfaces like how could I capture the the web page of which, you know, the Aragon or whatever voting app, uh, you know, takes place and actually, you know, put up a, a fake page and um, and co-opt governance in, in that way. Uh, and then we looked at economics and that was in particular or related in particular to sort of liquid staking markets and those as kind of a winner takes all market and, and talking about, you know, this has the potential to ratchet up in the same way as curve wars. 
uh, which actually sort of happened after we released um, released our uh, our assessment there. And there was um, another piece by someone called Sasha who um, built on our work and talks a, a lot more just in focus about liquid staking in relation to layer one protocols. When you have something like LIDAR that has been, you know, a first mover in the market and wildly you know, successful in many ways at providing liquid staking, not just on Ethereum, but on, you know, Cosmos, Polkadot, uh, Solana, and like all of these different ecosystems. Um, It's incredibly, incredibly important in terms of how their procedures happen of both, you know, change and consistency as well for those, um, those ecosystems. In terms of legal, we looked at uh, the registration of a DAO and some simple questions around intellectual property. So the DAO is not registered. Uh, you know, when we kind of asked about the competitive dynamics of that, uh, the general sentiment was, you know, would would like to see someone try. You know, as first movers, it would be very very hard to catch up in terms of just operationalizing what they have, which is extremely impressive in terms of the team and the scale and the complexity. Uh, but then you know, who owns the IP to the website which they're registered on, you know, these these kind of basic questions which which arise from that, from small to kind of larger scale around, you know, who's who's accountable if and when, uh, more likely when uh, some legislator, you know, wants to find out what's actually going on here. And so that assessment is available uh, on our blog and and was really interesting as well in terms of, this ongoing challenge of, and we talk about this in the ethnography of a DAO piece of like, how do you capture the attention of a DAO? Like if these are literally ephemeral sort of communities of shared attention space, we might not know each other, we might not see each other, but, you know, every day we're reading the same updates and posts and, you know, exchanging in a discourse around these shared, uh, you know, topics of of interest or whatever actually capturing the attention of a DAO to say like hey we've done this vulnerability assessment like now you need to think about what you want to address how to you know what possible responses to these are how do you prioritize those responses Um, that's ongoing work for us and I think the viable systems model is going to play a part in terms of organizing you know mapping and, and organizing you know, what needs to be addressed the most uh, in terms of uh, maintaining or or creating a viable system in that setting. Another client project is uh, Wildland. And so uh, they are in the throes of building a kind of data Docker container. So individually owned, uh, you know, large emphasis on kind of uh, private privacy and, um, infrastructural engagement or kind of owning your own infrastructure and they had proposed this sort of governance model that works alongside that around a user-defined organization and an economic system called proof of usage and so that was another really interesting one to kind of dive into analysis and maybe I'll throw to you Eric because that drew more on uh, some of the like what do we know from other very deep fields of research that also are applicable in this context. So, yeah, no, thank you. And I would, I'd, it, it, I'd give a shout out to the uh, recently forthcoming uh, or soon, soon to be forthcoming blog post with that project in particular, but a framework for kind of analyzing a lot of the valuable work that block science has done, analyzing these questions in particular is to me that of context specificity. And this will tie directly back to a lot of what we've been talking about, which is the easy approach for someone who wants to do comparative legal scholarship or comparative economic scholarship is, I can identify the features of these two systems. These are the same, these are different. Therefore, different outcomes are due to these differences. The problem is particularly acute in comparative legal scholarship, especially at the constitutional level. And this gets all the way back to the little c versus big C constitutional distinction we were describing earlier, which is, yes, 
many people did not smoke marijuana when it was illegal. But many people did. Meaning that at any point in time, a particular governance system is a function of its formally articulated rules. Those are easy to find. On blockchain networks, they're typically transparent and can, can be found as a matter of course. The problem is, is that is a set of rules coordinating a complex group of individuals with distinct motives and distinct reasons for organizing around that common animating purpose. Many times they're in agreement because they're still there, but in many important moments, especially for governance, they're in fundamental disagreement with one another. Understanding outcomes requires understanding those granular distinctions and the way in which the little C constitution of the community interacts with the big C constitution that has been enshrined in protocol in the case of distributed networks. And so this is kind of a humble plea for context-specific analysis. The toolkit that I've been describing today is, to my mind, hugely valuable for explaining outcomes but only if you do the hard ethnographic work of understanding the community and the reasons that people are there and the values that they hold that animate their activities. And so it's hard, but having a rigorous ontological framework is important. And that's part of what appeals to me about the work of block science. They have rigorous theoretical frameworks that they apply to highly context-specific analyses of a particular community. Only then can you explain observed outcomes and hopefully predict ones in the future. And so when it comes to performing the kind of client work that you mentioned, Kelsey, or applying these kinds of, uh, you know, uh, specific frameworks into context specific environments, what's usually the first step? Is it kind of then taking a step back and mapping the ontology and doing some of the kind of meta level thinking and planning before? And what, what does it actually look like to begin this journey uh, of some of the examples you both just gave? Definitely the mapping. And it's the mapping of some of the concepts we've talked about today. So from you know the animating purpose, like what's happening in you know the the little C and the BCs so are the formalized and, and kind of the informal um, constitution wise. It's uh, looking at the stakeholders and the various stakeholder interests and what uh, actions are available and kind of how that, you know, participation in the system works. So is it membership based? What are the rules of membership? How do people enter? How do people exit? Um, and so uh, some of those uh, again, I mean, as Eric mentioned, it's very context specific. Um, so sort of the fields I'm talking about, I'm, I'm thinking of a blog post that I have around um, understanding resilience in these systems that looks at, you know, observation of what's happening in the system and then moves to the action space of, you know, how are people behaving and, you know, what uh, actually needs to be kind of uh, diagnosed or proposed in terms of, again, this this idea of, um, you know, suggesting how to or what to address or what vulnerabilities there are towards uh, potentially more viability. So you can actually see some of these uh, maps that we've done. And there's a particularly interesting one of Gitcoin somewhere in their forums. Um, that was done by Zagam really in... Uh, you know, kind of in flight or amidst the transition from a project to a DAO, which is obviously a, you know, huge and seminal and, and kind of hallmark example of, of one of the first sort of attempts at scale post, you know, the PTSD of like the, the DAO, which, which was hacked, as Eric mentioned. And so this map you know, sets out some of those, you know, fields around um, stakeholders, you know, functional operations. So what different kind of working groups or units have, um, you know, emerged in this uh, transition or this kind of exit to community or to DAO. Um, so such a, such a fascinating example and, and hugely valuable in the legibility of these systems just to sit back and just the map alone to say what's happening here before even you know, trying to uh, solution anything is not necessarily something that's done often from a third party perspective or within 
these communities. And, um, you know, again, I come back to that, uh, that point around what makes this valuable is using these tools or this information that is, you know, surfaced uh, as a feedback loop. And that comes out of those ideas of, you know, cybernetics and second order cybernetics around how, you know, anthropology and uh, computational engineering work hand in hand. And so how do you actually look upon a system, look upon its participants and its designers, and then feed back those observations into the system to make it more uh, self-aware or uh, reflexive, as we say in ethnographic practice um, and in a, another uh, blog post um, by Zagam and I on techno-reflexivity. And in terms of the legibility of these systems, now that we've emphasized context specificity, I do want to make a humble plea for the theoretical frameworks that both Zargam and I use, which is to say, what is the easiest starting point to understand a system, to make it legible in Kelsey's words? It's the observable features typically which have been codified. It's obvious what type of consensus mechanism a blockchain network has. Therefore, that's a useful starting point. And so theory defines a lot of the features that are easily observable. Start with those and and ask yourself, what does the theory that we've briefly alluded to today tell you about those observable features? The deep challenge, though, whether you're an ethnographer or you're a constitutional scholar sympathetic to the little c versus big c constitutional distinction, is that context matters and that you will not understand a little c constitution of a community for distributed networks if you're not embedded in the Discord or Reddit forums dedicated to that particular community. But that's a lot more time consuming and harder than establishing whether a network has a specific consensus mechanism that's easily identifiable. And so for me, there's a union between these two approaches that's absolutely essential. Appreciate the context, but approach that context with a rigorous framework that tells you something to expect. And guess what? When your expectations are violated, there's probably something really interesting there, too. That's very true. And I I feel like we could dedicate a whole episode of where you go from step one uh, all the way through completing it. But uh, in respect of your and the audience's time, maybe we could jump ahead to sort of what are some of the things that y'all are actually interested in, in terms of governance research questions, uh, whether it's from, you know, that more meta level in terms of establishing more of these frameworks or looking in very uh, specific application domains or specific voting mechanisms or any kind of aspect and direction of the future of governance research. What are you both excited as we sort of continue through the end of 2022 into next year? For me, what I'm interested in is the discipline of a bear market. Things are great when there's a steady influx of capital. To me, though, I've already emphasized about why conflict defines governance on important margins. When are you likely to see more conflict? when resources in a particular community are scarce. But in a general sense, and this isn't to belittle the real economic harm that price movements entail, but in a general sense for the industry, market discipline means winners emerge and losers fall away. And so to me, it's, it's I think this current bear market that we're experiencing is going to be a fascinating one for governance because it means conflict will emerge with more predictable uh, with, with more predictable periodicity. And so therefore it will be kind of a proving moment for different governance systems on different networks when they all have access to investment capital and speculative retail investors crowding in on every exchange they can. That's not a context where hard decisions have to be wrought by and large. But in a bear market, this is one that is fruitful analytical material for governance scholars such such as Kelsey and myself, even if we can't call ourselves governance experts. 
It's much easier to not have points of tension when it feels like money is endlessly raining down from the skies. Now that people have real budgets they need to stick to, it's a very different environment. But yeah, Kelsey? I'm really interested in some of the dominant narratives in the space around governance. So these ideas of governance automation and governance minimization and kind of disambiguating what that actually means to people and what that actually means in relation to some of these other you know, precedents or, you know, grounding concepts around, uh, you know, reachability in terms of how how achievable is the the animating purpose of of the thing or requisite variety as we spoke about and and viability. So that's one area and I've touched on that uh, a little bit in some of uh, the Lido work uh, and in some forthcoming stuff. Uh, An ongoing area of interest for me is around uh, autonomy. And so uh, I've done a lot of, uh, I guess, ethnographic investigation when I wanted to know, like, what does everyone mean by decentralized autonomous organization? And there was kind of no dialogue happening around that. Um, Zagam surfaced some really great work by someone called Thomas Swan, who in a book on uh, cybernetics and uh, anarchy speaks about the difference between functional autonomy and collective autonomy. And there's a forthcoming uh, blog post where um, based on a presentation that Zagam gave on that, we're just going to set out those ideas for people to consume or challenge or build on or whatever they want to do, apply. Uh, I'm interested in DAO's automation and AI. I think it's something that was talked about in the original concept of DAOs, but is, you know, we're obviously not there yet. And uh, I think, you know, part of the reason I really appreciate and enjoy my own engagement with block science is the opportunity to, you know, better understand these uh, inseparable uh components of these systems that are way outside of my field of expertise, Uh, you know, so drawing on, you know, our kind of collective intelligence on, you know, what is, what does this mean? You know, what, like, what are, like sometimes we'll just have, you know, conversations. It's like these ground truths of like, what are algorithms? Like, what do we mean when we talk about algorithms? You know, what is AI? What, uh, what is the potential of AI in, you know, governance in DAOs, like what are the fundamental misconceptions around that when people just, you know, whitewash it or broad brush it and these kinds of things. Uh, And so to that point, uh, another area which uh, we've kind of flagged in in a post, and I keep talking about blog posts because I think it's something that we really intentionally try and do around uh, socializing ideas and, and methodologies and findings and all these things as much as we can as part of this kind of broader community discourse. Uh, but one of those is on algorithmic policy making. And so the relation between, you know, humans and uh, machines or, or kind of computational processes in these uh, governance systems and how that actually is a a policy making exercise and and what the kind of you know hierarchies are there or where you actually need um you know for me I'm interested in like where's the human input actually um necessary and, and kind of how do you sort of rehumanize these systems in some ways. So that's a lot, but there's always a lot of interesting things and um also, I should mention, we're always looking for, you know, super engaged people that, you know, care about this kind of stuff and want to develop both as, you know, researchers and practitioners in this space. So I'll, I'll throw that out there. Um, I also wanted to make sure I, I mentioned, you know, one of the kind of wildest parts of uh, working in this field is that you can shape it. You know, it's not... Um, an academic experience where you're sort of just off uh, in discourse with your peers through peer-to-peer publications. But, you know, the ideas that we're coming up with and the people that we have the privilege of working in is like actively shaping, you know, how these systems are, you know, conceived of and designed and built and and play out in many senses, which is, I guess, a... uh, challenge and and a responsibility which which we take pretty seriously around uh the broader goal of kind of engineering safer systems it's also a really cool opportunity 
I agree it's a challenge and a responsibility. Yeah, but for those who are excited by uh, that landscape of opportunity, now is a really interesting time. And I think especially through the bear market, we're going to see a lot of focused and intentional experimentation with what can actually drive uh, meaningful governance primitives and new ideas forward. So uh, very much excited to see what else comes out of block science, what other research, uh, Eric, you and your collaborators come up with, and in general, what various communities kind of surface here. So I just really appreciate both of you taking the time to kind of provide some of these explainers and background on governance as a concept and providing some highlights and insights into what's going on in the world of block science, specifically in the realm of governance research and exploration. Thanks so much for having us. Um, and again, just shout out to SCURF and all of the activity that you're supporting and, and facilitating and encouraging in the space. Absolutely. No, this has been this has been a hugely fun conversation. And to me, it's this type of conversation that moves the ball forward in terms of challenging governance problems in a context that we don't know all the answers. That makes it exciting, makes it kind of risky, but to me, I wouldn't be anywhere else.